Ready for a check? When the first rains fell, the earth awakened. Where rivers wandered, life could flourish. They have shaped us as a species, and we worship them as gods. Today, there's scarcely a river unspanned, undammed, or undiverted. The sheer scale of the human project has begun to overwhelm the world's rivers. Our gods had become our subjects. give us so much more than water. They have flowed through our lives as surely as they have flowed through places. But as we have learned to harness their power, have we also forgotten to revere them? Following the breathtaking grandeur of Mountain River is the middle chapter of director Jennifer Peedham's planned trilogy of orchestral concert films that explore the impact of landscape on the human experience. Um, in addition to her reteaming with narrator Willem Dafoe, vocalist William Barton, writer Robert McFarlane and the Australian Chamber Orchestra, Jennifer is this time joined on her global filmmaking journey by co-director and co-writer uh, Joseph Nazetto and both Jen and Joseph join us on screen watching. Congratulations on this, uh, a wonderful, wonderful film. Thank you, Simon. Well, thanks, Simon. Help us understand, first of all, this, this collaborative process. Jen, what element did Joseph bring to, to River that wasn't in Mountain? Why, why are we on board with him? Well, Joseph actually was the, the first phone call I ever received from the Australian Chamber Orchestra about mountains. So he used to work at the Australian Chamber Orchestra. And so we got to know each other over a number of years working on mountain together. And what I discovered during that process really was that he had this kind of encyclopedic cinematic knowledge and was really great on story. So he started consulting with us at Strange in the Fiction Films on other projects and other scripts I've been working on, both fiction and, and non-fiction. Um, and I realised he was just a great asset, basically. And because, and, and then so when it came to making River, what he really brought to the table was this, this connection back to the Australian Chamber Orchestra, because obviously music is so important in the context of these suite of films. Um, and, and having his kind of you know, story now, but also that that encyclopedic musical knowledge as well, um, and 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 he has a degree in musicology. So it was a it was an asset on on a couple of levels, um, and also you know he's a talented young filmmaker, so I'm keen to bring people up. Well, that that leads me to my next question, Joseph. Working with Jen, I did it twenty <laughs> odd years ago, and it was hell. Um, what aspect of your talent did she exploit and take credit for? Oh, very good. Um, I mean, we are working with Jen on this was obviously amazing. Um, and because I, I guess working with Jen is not just working with Jen, but you know, just the best filmmaking talent in, in Australia wants to work with Jen. So working with editor Simon Yo, working with sound design uh, and sound mix from 
Robert McKenzie and his team working with Robert McFarlane um, in the UK remotely. It was just amazing to be brought into that team and brought into that fold. And it, it was really exciting for me as well because we had Mountain sort of set the tone and set the style of the storytelling. What I was able to do a lot of the time is in writing, in music, uh, in the footage research and in kind of developing the you know, the vision for the film, I was able to sort of just scout out ahead a lot of the time. I was doing a lot of research in those different departments, um, but it was really, um, it was a beautiful experience because I was able to just sort of get excited about things, bring them back to Jen, and she would always have such a clear, visceral, strong response to, oh, that's amazing, that could go here, that could help connect that idea or really land that idea or take that idea to the next level. Um, so it was really beautiful being able to just research and get excited about the topic and um, go away and find as many things as I was able to and then bring them back to Jen who could unify them in the vision and the story of, of the bigger film. And, and that vision, it's such a unique form of documentary filmmaking, what you're doing with Mountain and, and, and now River. Um, the closest I can get to a comparison of any kind of the films of, of Ron Frick and Godfrey Reggio, the, the Barakas and the Koyanis Fatsi films, um, but also not. How do you describe a work like River, Jen? They are like that. And, and, you know, movies like Baraka were a really strong reference point. Um, you know, when we started making Mountain, we weren't even sure whether or not we would have narration. I remember Christian Gazal, the editor, broke down Baraka and tried to understand what about it worked. Um, so it was that was very much part of the influence from the get go. But, you know, we realised that at a certain point that narration needed to be part of the story because Otherwise, I couldn't say everything I wanted to say. And, mm. and in Mountain, the partnership came through Robert McFarlane, who'd written this amazing book on called Mountains of the Mind, which I had read as a young mountaineer back in the years where we used to be working together. And, um, you know, it then it just translated into River. He hasn't written a specific book about River, so it was a quite a different creative process this time. But, um, and, you know, and Joseph really played into that because he did a huge amount of research like bringing in poetry and bits from books I mean the amount of reading and scouring and research he did like I just don't know how I would have had time to have done all that so it was really instrumental into in in the whole process um but yeah I guess I would describe them as we we, we describe them as sort of cinematic and musical odysseys so they're kind of like some people call them stoner films you know um they are films that you kind of are very experiential and you you kind of go in and you you have to think differently and one of the reasons you know you have to let them wash over you to some extent and one of the reasons that we you know on, on mountain and then again we did the same thing on river as we introduced the the opening titles are the orchestra tuning up um and we kind of introduce willem and we introduce in in river we also introduce um, William Barton, who is the amazing um, Indigenous vocalist and composer on the project as well, um, because I wanted the audience to feel like they were sitting down at a big concert, because that helps explain part of how the, these films look and feel, because they were designed as concerts. And that is the reason there are no talking heads and no people talking about rivers per se. They are these very big global um points of view i guess um looking at the world from a from that very global point of view joseph I mean, case, literally from space um, sure yeah exactly and joseph the the, the musical elements the, the the background you have um mm. in music and and queuing up the visuals with the the orchestrations um mm. what sort of strengths does jen as a filmmaker and in your collaboration um how, how does that play out yeah, I, I mean, the, yeah, the, the way it plays out in collaboration with the Australian Chamber Orchestra and Richard Tonietti is totally unique for a film score. Um, I mean, typically in a film production, the, the composer sort of slips into the production alongside the, you know, set designer and the costume designer uh, and, and the cinematographer and other kind of um, collaborators in the project in a hierarchy that you sort of, you know, sort of know as the typical kind of Hollywood hierarchy. Uh, that typical Hollywood hierarchy that doesn't exist when you're working with a group like the Australian Chamber Orchestra who will be taking this thing on tour. So the overall just amount of bandwidth for music in the experience for the audience is much higher, I'd say, than a typical documentary film, um, that's for sure. Um, and in terms of collaborating with Richard, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a long process, actually, just spending a lot of time playlisting, you know, spending time thinking about what the overall palette of the score is, 
Also interesting practical constraints that you wouldn't typically need to deal with on a film um, involved looking at River Live. So actually when they were touring the film down the track, what resources would they have to tour the film? And actually limitations around that touring ended up applying back to the film and the film score itself, um, which is kind of interesting. It was interesting having those constraints on River Live actually apply back to um, the theatrical experience as well. But you know, as we know, in every creative domain, those limitations actually lead to really interesting solutions and um, yeah, and, and just sort of creative problem solving that you wouldn't typically uh, come across otherwise. You, you've touched on my next question there quite a bit. On, on most films, if things work out, the director has the, the final say, Jen. Mm. But I can't imagine you telling McFarlane what to write or Defoe about inflection or, or Richard Tonetti, you know, I need more violin here. Are you as hands-on throughout the process as a director traditionally is? Um, I mean, look, to speak to Willem Dafoe specifically, he's just a fantastic actor. We'd already done, um, you know, one film together and we spent a lot more time in that particular instance working out the character and then it took a lot less time to work it out this time and he's just, you know, he's just a, a fabulous and very professional actor. In the case uh, with Robert, again, it was the three of us on Zoom, you know, sometimes what I often describe as the way I worked with Robert is to write the bad version. Um, I'd be like, all right, here's the really, really bad version. And then he'd, you know, make it beautiful and, and ping it back over. And, um, you know, he was just a complete joy to work with. I mean, he's one of the nicest people on the planet, really. Um, and then with Richard, um, it, it's, you know, he is very protective of his audience and that space and that rigour makes him who he is and, and, and the amazing performer that he is. So, you know, we absolutely had differences of opinion and there was argy-bargy and there were some ideas that I really wanted to go through. And then, I mean, one great example actually is the fantastic um, Bart Violin Concerto with that amazing drone shot where oh. the, the camera just plunges down that, waterfall from the glacier from the glacier down. down it's a beautiful yeah. oh god it made me giddy it's beautiful to watch. yeah and i had something that i really really wanted to be there and he really really wanted the bark and we just couldn't see how it was going to work to take this violin concerto it was the wrong length it was the wrong a whole lot of things it didn't work and he he was determined and he rearranged that solo violin concerto and into an orchestral version that worked for the Australian Chamber Orchestra and somehow made it work to length and rearranged it. And, you know, I have to hand it to him. It was, it was a magnificent mm. pairing and it's absolutely thrilling. And I still get goosebumps when I mm. watch it every single time. And so it's, you know, I think you just have to be open in a project like this to, you know, R Richard said it himself, there was a couple of times on mountain, you know, it's like, may the best idea win. You know, and as long as there is that openness to, um, uh, you know, to that creative process, we all feel creatively vulnerable. I think that's the thing. And, and when you can understand where that person is coming from and why they feel vulnerable, you know, he has an orchestra with a, an audience that has a very different expectation, like Joseph said earlier, about, you know, classical works and how they'll play and, and all sorts of things. And you can't just fade out Mozart or, sure. you know, cut Beethoven. So... You know, it's it's a it's a it's a really interesting, um, challenging, but ultimately really rewarding process. Willem Dafoe says in the film, rivers are indifferent to human plans and dreams. Um, as we record this, the rivers are still receding along the New South Wales coastline. You can't say the word river in the current climate without thinking about what's happened in Lismore and its and its surrounds. Um, are Australian audiences primed for a film that paints the rivers of the world as the planet's arteries? Is, are rivers in a good space with Australians right now? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question and it's incredible how timely this is. I think this film asks the right questions about rivers and our desires to control them and how that can backfire. And there is a lot of story and a lot of conversation going on right now about dams and about raising dam walls and about development on floodplains um, that I think uh, are well examined by, by watching this film. In fact, I got an email this morning from someone up in Lismore who was a, a water specialist wanting to use the film as a, as a tool to talk about what is going on with the river system. So 
you know, it would be great actually if this film could be part of the conversation that that is going on around river and water management in this country mm. and flood management. Yeah. Uh, do, do you mind if I add something to that? Of course. Yeah, I'll say, I mean, the film, I mean, as we were creating it, obviously there, were, there weren't these sort of um, these disasters unfolding, but very much what the film explores is the idea that the people who will come after us will, will live in the shadow of the decisions that we make. Um, and it sort of goes without saying that the experiences of, uh, the tragic experiences of Australians over the last couple of weeks, it, it's, that, that really is a product of us living in the shadow of decisions that people made decades or centuries ago. Um, and I still think those same ideas that we're talking about in terms of poor short-term decisions or, you know, trading short-term gain for, you know, long-term uh, loss uh, that the film kind of explores, they very much apply to the current situation. And, it's, and it definitely isn't about accusing, you know, people who might live in a floodplain of making some ridiculous life decision. Uh, it's about acknowledging that that isn't going to be a sustainable situation now or in the future and doing something like raising damn walls so that you can uh, develop more property in more floodplain areas is actually just setting us up, setting up the average Australian citizen who goes through that decision um, for you know that frustration in the future. Um, and so there are tough decisions that we can make now. I think you know if as you know if we have the collective willpower to deal with something like the coronavirus crisis, I think we just need to become better and better at having the collective willpower to deal with problems like climate change that you can't necessarily see in the same way uh, until they're too late. The, the film's sequence, and I don't want to give too much away here, but there's a sequence at the end of the film where the, the dams are destroyed. And I've never felt sort of a swell in my chest like that. I've, I've, to see these scenes happen on screen, it was it impacted upon me the emotional connection your film is able to draw to, to the plight of rivers and the plight of mankind's or humankind's um, relationship with it. So it's a, that, that's a job well done. And I guess at the other end of the spectrum is the damage that us humans have, have wrought upon the rivers of the world, easily harnessed, but not easily mended, as Willem says. Um, the industrial revolution almost destroyed them. Can the environmental revolution restore the glory that you capture on screen? I hope so. I mean, there's been, Joseph, you'll probably speak better to this than me, but you know, there's examples all over the world, I believe the, the Rhine, um, 10 years ago was biologically dead um, and, and governments have acted to, to you know, improve that situation. Um, Joseph, you should speak to that. Yeah, the, the, the Thames in London was biologically dead for decades and for a river to be biologically dead means that the oxygen content is so low that nothing can actually survive, you know, organisms can't thrive. Um, we've seen that ecosystem, you know, be restored or at least, you know, that part of the ecosystem be restored. Uh, different European governments. So in the Netherlands, they've introduced a government policy about making room for the river and actually sort of rather than allowing real estate developers to put more and more people in floodplains, actually begin to slowly over decades clear out space around the banks of rivers so that they can be allowed to run wild uh, and perform these vital functions that they perform for the ecosystem. And just to acknowledge that, yeah, no, we, we can't actually control them. You know, our, our attempt to control them uh, in all the ways that are convenient for us has been you know, it was a sensible decision in the past based on everything we understood, but our understanding of actually what a wild river does and can do for us, not just for Indigenous cultures who connect with them culturally, but just for cities, for instance, who benefit from having a beautiful wild river running through them, they, they, those benefits are sort of too great to ignore and the harms are too uh, terrible to ignore also. So at the end of all this, Jen, what's your favourite river? You've seen all these rivers from around the world. Do you have a favourite? Um... You know, I grew up in Canberra, and so my happiest memories of, of, of rivers are like being on lilos floating down the Murrumbidgee <laughs> River. And also, um, you know, as, as you know, I've spent a lot of time up in the Himalayas, and when you trek up in that region, you are endlessly crossing those rope ladders across these rivers that are, that are bringing the water from the Himalayas down to, to billions of people, and it is something you really often think about that when you, you're in that part of the world. So um, yeah, they'd be my favorites. And Joseph, you sound well-versed in the river systems of the world. You must have a favorite. Um, yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I've, I've spent so much time working on this project, looking at rivers from space actually. And so many of my favorite rivers are actually ones I've never been to. I've, not, I've never been to the Himalayas, but there's an extraordinary river system called the Brahmaputra that, that comes down from the Himalayas. And these two or three mighty uh, rivers that melt from the glaciers you can see it from space, they kind of go down and weave into this tight braid that then eventually becomes the Ganges and goes down to wow. 
the Sandar Burns, which is this extraordinary um, outlet to the ocean that we show in the film as well. So I've become, yeah, quite enamored with, with rivers. And you can just pull up, you know, Google Earth and see this. It's right there. Uh, just, just rivers that exist on these scales that sort of, you know, defy uh, our imagination. Or I think even standing at the banks, you wouldn't see it for what it is. It's only when you really step back and take a look at it that you can see it um, as, you know, as something really different and extraordinary. Uh, after two years of spending the bulk of my life on a certain corner of a certain couch, um, this is also a beautiful travel log film. The, the images of nature and and um, what you capture on screen just just makes me want to get out of the house and and go right around the world. And um, it's definitely a film to be seen on the big screen, March twenty four in cinemas everywhere. Um, and then later in the year, it'll come to your small screen. Certainly worth watching on any format, but do try and get out and see it on the big screen, everyone. Jen Peedham, Joseph Nazetti, thank you so much for spending some time with us on screen watching and for this, um, this incredibly beautiful film. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Thank you again. Bye.